Well, good morning, fellow constitutionalists, and welcome to the Thursday edition of the Dan Columbus Show, a Christian political talk show. This is episode 836. I'm your host, Dan Clements, your constitutional warrior fighting for your right just to be an American. It is July 6th, near of the Lord, 2017. Remember, we're a hyphen-free, PC-free zone. God is still in control and He does love you. And I am broadcasting live from the Hemlock Studios here in the beautiful central Susquehanna Valley in the great Keystone State. And if you uh, want to... Uh, I do have the chat room still open, so I don't know if that's going to help anything. Uh, but I do have the chat room still open on YouTube. I'm not streaming. I, it just for some reason I just can't stream, and uh, it's it's very frustrating uh, <clears throat> because of the uh, uh, my router's going bad, and on top of that, my sound board, my mixer's going bad. So I'm uh, I'm limping along with the mixer, but the sound, the uh, router I cannot absolutely do without. Uh, running three computers like I am, I actually need a uh, <laughs> uh, a Giga switch, what they call a Giga a Gigabyte uh, Ethernet card in the router. And the new one I got coming in is a D-Link. I'm getting away from Buffalo. It seems like I have to replace those every uh, every year to two years because the radio part of it burns out in it because it gets too hot. And I don't even have it overclocked. So anyway, uh, getting on with the show here. Um. It is raining out here in the central Susquehanna Valley. I, I do have a good show set up for you folks. Uh, let me get the uh, uh, show notes page up. Um, there's CNN has shot themselves in the foot. <laughs> if you haven't been following this, if you go, if you got a Twitter account, go to um, uh, hashtag or, or the pound sign CNN blackmail. Just punch that in and see what's going on. Evidently, they hunted down the person who posted, or at least they think. Uh, this morning, they were saying that uh, this gentleman that they hunted down originally on Reddit may not actually be the one that produced the video and put it out to begin with, okay? and uh, But they used their considerable resources to hunt this guy down, uh, threaten him as far as with uh, lawsuits and everything else, and, and exposing him to the, the, the public. And then... <laughs> To top, to top that all off, and this, this t- to me, this is funny. Um, they told him if, if he behaved himself and didn't do this anymore, uh, that they wouldn't release his information to the public. Uh, to me, that's a blackmail. You know, you're threatening somebody to keep quiet or you'll do something else. That's blackmail. I don't care how the, the anti-freedom groups out there spin it. And what, what happened, folks, I went on last night and, and put that hashtag, hashtag CNN, blackmail and you ought to see the gifts gif the gifts that are being produced out there with cnn as the butt of the joke on whatever it was (laughs) the for whatever reason for whatever reason elitists think they're above everything they literally think that they can get away with just about anything that they want, and there's going to be no repercussions. Now, my question is, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but my question is, why didn't they use their considerable resources to make sure that the uh, Russia story was true? <laughs> just, <laughs> oh, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just telling you, folks. Um, it, it just amazes me. It amazes me of the ignorance. Uh, of these folks. It really, really does. Uh, so it's, uh, again, uh, these guys are just uh, hilarious uh, when it comes to stuff like this. It really does. Uh, I'm just getting some stuff. I, I, like I said, I was dealing with some technical issues. I didn't get everything quite up to snuff to where, uh, where it should be, but we're going to get, we're going to get there folks. We really, really, really are. Um, Today's show is uh, not brought to you by, but this is the official drink of the Dan Clemens Show, Rocky Mountain High Brands. Uh, they have several different flavors there, as you can see. Uh, black tea, mango energy, berry, mixed berry energy, uh, coconut lime energy drink, and, and a straight lemonade. And uh, the lemonade is the only thing that doesn't have any caffeine in it, which is what I've been drinking. And uh, But it has 100 milligrams of hemp oil in it. That seems to help my fibromyalgia. They also have energy shots, 
uh, protein bars with uh, hemp in it, and they also have a uh, a water called Eagle Spirits. It's a a um, uh, it's not an acidic. It's a uh, I can't even remember off the top of my head. I'm so befuddled this morning, but it's a it's the opposite of acidic drink, and it's supposed to be really really good for you. And full disclosure, I do own stock in the um, um, in the company as part of my retirement portfolio. All right, today's uh daily Bible reading comes from the uh, the book of Exodus and it's uh, Exodus chapter 3 verse 5 it says, do not come any closer God said take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground and the reason why and folks the reason why I bring this up is because too many times in Christianity and a lot of other denominations or uh, religions uh, they worshiped objects instead of the Creator of those objects and it wasn't it wasn't that the ground in and of itself was holy it was because God was there is is because his holy angel was there you know or, or God's presence was there in the burning bush and it says here don't come any closer God said take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy God made the ground holy didn't stay permanently holy, but it, it gives us idea that when you're in the presence of God, uh, that is holy, and everything around it becomes holy because of that. Today's quote mail comes from Douglas Rhymes. If our faith is not relevant to our daily life in the world and in the parish, then it is no use. And if we cannot be Christians in our work, in the neighborhood, in our political decisions, then we had better stop being Christians. A piety reserved for Sunday is no message for this age. And I like that quote, Neil, and that's something I'm going to keep in mind. Um, because this, uh, and, and I do keep this in mind because I live this. My Christianity, my faith is part of my life, folks, and, and it, always, it always will be uh, part of my life. And today's uh, uh, short Bible lesson comes from Biblical Proof. Let me get over there. And uh, it's, this is from Al Shannon, and it's just like the denominations. I'll read just the first little bit of this uh, on here. He said that the people of God have a tendency to become uh, dissatisfied with God's ways and uh, to desire the ways of men. The Old Testament supplies us with example after example where this is true. At the time of Samuel, when Jehovah was still considered king of Israel, the people clamored to the prophet, make us a king. Or, 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 and I'll, I'll let you continue the reading. That'll be up in the show notes page right after the show. And it's, it's amazing to me how many people want to veer away from the pure word of God. They want to peer, uh, uh, veer away from the pure word of God and not follow God's word and think they know best how to do things. And I can't tell you how many times in my life that where when I left God out of my decisions, things went horribly, horribly wrong. And it was, it's not that God was punishing me. It, it was that I didn't have my mind set right. I didn't have my mind going in the right direction. And I was leaving God out of my decisions and everything. So be mindful of that, folks. Be very, very mindful. All right. Um... There's a couple, let's see, I didn't get to that one. Well, there, there's one article before I get into the CNN story uh, that comes from uh, the Convention of the States. And it's uh, DC's um, formal serious abuses of power. And now you know that I, I'm supportive of the Convention of the States. I think we need to have an Article 5 uh uh, amendments, uh, you know, convention of the states to amend the Constitution to rein in uh, some of the regulatory power, some other stuff they're going to talk about here. Um, and this is just put out by the whole staff over there at the um, uh, Convention of the States project. Sometimes it's important to get back to the basics. And that's my show used to be back to basics uh, until I rebranded. Uh, these issues have been posted on the Convention of the States website since the f founding of the organization despite last November's election they're just as dangerous today as they were in 2013 these abuses are not 
mere instances of bad policy. They represent fundamental, or excuse me, foundational structural issues that cannot be fixed by one person, party, or election. And this we've been saying this for a long time, folks, especially over here in the Constitution Party. We've been saying that you, you, you can't fix what's wrong with just elections. And, and the Founding Fathers knew this also. That's why they put the Convention of the States in the Article 5 to amend the Constitution. One, the spending and debt crisis. Uh, the 19 trillion, dollar, trillion national debt is staggering. Uh, under standard accounting practices, the federal government owes around 100 trillion more invested Social Security benefits and other programs. This is why the government cannot tax its way out of the debt. Even if it confiscated everything, it would not cover the debt. Two, the regulatory crisis. The federal bureaucracy has placed a regulatory burden upon, burden upon businesses that is complex, uh, complicated, and crushing. Little accountability exists when, agent, when agencies, rather than Congress, enact the real uh, substance of the law. Research, research from the American Enterprise Institute shows that since 1949, federal regulations have lowered to real GDP growth by 2% and made Americans 72% poorer. Three, congressional attacks on state sovereignty. This is huge here, folks. Uh, this whole marijuana issue is one of those state sovereignty issues. For years, Congress has been using federal grants to keep the states under control. Combining these grants with federal mandates, which are rarely fully funded, Congress has turned state legislatures into their regional agencies rather than respecting them as a truly independent Republican government. A radical social agenda and an invasion of the rights of the people accompanying all of this. While, su while sufficient efforts have been made to combat the social erosion, these trends defy some of the most important principles. Four, the federal takeover of decision-making process. The founders believe that the structures of a limited government would provide the greatest protection of liberty. Not only were there to be checks and balances between the branches of the federal government, power was to be shared between the states and the federal government with the latter only exercising those powers specifically granted in the Constitution. Collusion among decision makers in DC has replaced these checks and balances. The federal judiciary supports Congress and the White House in their ever escalating attack upon the jurisdiction of the 50 states. We need to realize that the structure of decision making matters. Who decides what the law shall be is as important as what is decided. The protection of liberty requires a strict adherence to the principles that power is limited and delegated. Washington, D.C. does not believe this principle as evidenced by an unbroken practice of expanding the boundaries of the federal government. In a remarkably frank admission, the Supreme Court rebuffed a challenge to the federal spending power despite acknowledging that the power had grown far beyond the bounds envisioned by the founders. Now, this was in New York versus uh, United States in 1992. This framework has sufficiently has been sufficiently flexible over the past two centuries to allow for enormous changes in the nature of government. The federal government undertakes activities today that would have been unimaginable to the framers in two cents. First, because the framers would not have con uh, conceived that any government would conduct such activities, and second, because of the framers would not have believed that the federal government, rather than the states, would assume such responsibilities. Yet the powers conferred upon the federal government by the Constitution were, fa were phrased in language broad enough to allow for the expansion of the federal government's role. I disagree with that. I disagree with that reading of the, the, the powers in the Constitution. They're only expansive when you want to make them that way. Because people have forgotten in the Constitution, the Constitution was written to restrict the federal government, to limit the powers of the federal government. If that is your guiding principle in reading, and it should be, if you take the Constitution in context, if that is your guiding principle, how in the world do you expand all these powers? See, to me, that's, that's a fallacy. That's, that's a, to me, that's a non-starter altogether there. What does this mean? This is not a partisan issue. Washington, D.C. will never voluntarily relinquish meaningful power. No matter who is elected, the only rational conclusion is this. Unless some political force outside of Washington, D.C. intervenes, the federal government will continue to bankrupt this nation 
embezzle the legitimate authority of the states and destroy the liberty of the people rather than securing the blessings of liberty for future generations. Washington, D.C. is on a pass, path that will enslave our children and grandchildren to the debts of the past. The problem is big, but we have a solution. Article 5 gives us a tool to fix this mess in D.C. I think this is a, a very good uh, article to have and read right after, you know, a couple days after the 4th of July. And this is, this is something that's serious in our country, folks, and this is something that's filtered down. There's, a, there's an old, and, I, and honestly, I don't know who said it. It's an old proverb. Uh, as, as the leaders of a nation go, so go the nation. Our leaders in this country, not every one of them, but the vast majority, enough of them to make a huge difference in this country, are immoral. Uh, they are, may I say, evil in their practices when it comes to governance over the people. Uh, they are selfish. They are power-driven, power-hungry. They'll do anything they can, lie, cheat, and steal to stay in power. And that's a problem. And then that filters down to the rest of the country. We'll, and we're getting into the CNN story, and CNN has its head full of itself thinking that, that hey, we're, we're a actual journalistic news site on cable TV. And these people out there shouldn't be picking on us. Uh, the new Main Street media with, their, with the podcasters and, and, and folks like myself who commentate on the news, uh, we're nothing. And, and I'll, folks, I'll be the first one to admit to you, I'm not a journalist. I, I'm not a journalist. I do a little bit of writing here and there, but I'm not a journalist. That's not my passion. But I do follow people that are journalists. Uh, a, a, a young man named Tim Poole on YouTube, if you go look him up, Tim Poole, I think it's P-O-O-L-E-E -E or L-E. Um, he's, a, he's a citizen journalist, and he does a good job of trying to share both sides, and he, he understands his bias. What CNN has forgot, and a lot of the lamestream media has forgot, they forgot that they have a bias. And they run around acting like they don't have a bias. And they run around acting just like the leaders of our nation. They're very corrupt, they're very power hungry, and they'll do anything with their power, and within their power, to garner, increase, and maintain the power that they think they have. And the problem with CNN is they don't have the power. The people, and, and this is the great thing about the internet, folks especially with, uh, uh, for me anyway, it started off with Blog Talk Radio, and then now it's at where I'm actually simulcasting on YouTube. And this is fantastic. I mean, this is fantastic, folks, that, that citizens can go out there and, and actually either report on the story and be a journalist, find out both sides of the story and report it accurately, and don't shade the truth, don't hide any facts, and share that with folks. And then guys like me, I can sit and commentate on this. I can commentate on these stories coming from these citizen journalists or from this what we call the new Main Street media, uh, like the Daily Wire, Daily Signal, Daily Caller, uh, some of these, uh, the Washington Free Beak, and some of these other more conservative news outlets in the nation, like the, like the Washington Examiner, uh, you know, the Washington Free Beacon, Western Journal. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of other ones, and, and, and including sites like Breitbart. I know people are like, oh, he said Breitbart, ah, one of these alt-right. And, and folks, I do. I have an issue and problem keeping track of all these names uh, uh, on all these, <laughs> all these different uh, names that these people give people. It's ridiculous. And, and I, I submit to you to get away from this left-right paradigm because it's doing the country no favor. It's doing your debate and your arguments that you put forth and the reasons you do things, it, it just taints them. And it gives people the wrong, the wrong idea because there are just as many bad people on the right as there is on the left. I'm sorry to tell you that. So I think instead of trying to weed them out that way, because we're not God. <laughs> God's going to part people on the right and the left. We're not God. I submit to you, and I think the test should be, if somebody's going to restrict my freedom, put them in the anti-freedom group. If someone's going to um, have less restrictions on my freedom and not grant me my freedom, but allow me to exercise my freedoms and liberties uh, the way I see fit, I put them in the freedom crowd. Now, are there going to be shades in the middle 
Absolutely, but here's, here's the kicker. You can't be in the freedom crowd and still want, in some aspect of your life, still want to restrict somebody's freedoms, their fundamental freedoms. You can't be that way. And, and you can't be in the anti-freedom crowd where you're going to restrict the freedoms and liberties of folks. But maybe in this one instance, I'm okay with, you know, allowing. And this is what it is from the anti-freedom crowd. We allow people to exercise. Uh, excuse me. You don't allow me to do nothing. It just, the freedom crowd has way less restrictions on my freedoms and liberty. They actually, they want to enhance. The freedom crowd wants to enhance my freedoms and liberties. Not that they grant them to us. But they want to make sure that I, ha I can exercise all the freedoms and liberties that I choose to exercise. That should be up to the individual, not the state. And this is where the paradigm has to go. And we have this, um, it, it's, it's ridiculous what's happening with, with CNN. They, they should have not poked the hornet's nest or the sleeping bear or the sleeping giant. You put your metaphor in there. They should not have poked the internet because for all the good that we get out of the internet there are some funnier and I won't say that's good or bad but there's also some darker sides to the internet and I won't even call these memes or anything on the darker side I put them in, in this funny category that you really it's hard to you know you can't say it's some people say it's mean-spirited other people don't and those are opinions and people have a lot of opinions and opinions are, are like uh, armpits uh, a lot of times they just stink not all the time but a lot of times they just stink right uh, you have you have two <laughs> you have two of them and they stink <laughs> and we talked about opinions yesterday on the show if your opinions are thought out rational reason fact fact based and truth filled they're pretty good opinions to have uh, if you have and, and, and opinions need to be if you're going to do things that affect other people either their lives or their livelihood or whatever if, if they affect more than just yourself then those opinions must be objective which means they have to have facts and truth and must be reasoned out if if your if your opinions just affect yourself what color t-shirt am I going to wear underneath this shirt? What, sh what color shirt am I going to wear? What, co what type of ball cap am I going to wear on the show today? Uh, we're talking about painting the back wall here, or maybe even the side walls too, but we're talking about painting the back wall back here. What color should we paint the wall? That's all very subjective. It, it, it's personal taste. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the different types of paint, uh, there's some better than others, but when you get into the upper, you know, when you start buying the better brands or the, the higher quality in the different brands, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between them. There might be some subtle differences. And even then, uh, that's, that's a subjective opinion because I, I haven't researched paint. And I don't know too many people besides painters that research paint so they can have an objective opinion about what the best paint is to use. You see where I'm getting at here? So CNN, <laughs> in their arrogance... I mean, in their total arrogance, folks, <laughs> they poke the bear, and they are getting hammered. I mean, they are really, really getting hammered, and I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you exactly what I mean when I get over here on Twitter on the other. I had, like I said, I had to switch com computers this morning, folks, and uh, let me see if I can get over here. I don't know if I've been logged in here or not. Yes, I have. Okay, uh, let me bookmark this because I keep for uh, this computer, the production computer, I don't normally get online with too much because it's mainly for my production. Uh, but over, over on Twitter, they are having a heyday. They're having an actual heyday on this stuff. And it's, it's real funny uh, to me how, what's happening here. And just, uh, I, I'll do some screenshots here for you. Like I said, it's... <laughs> It's it's real funny what's what's going on here with uh, uh, with them. Let me get let me check this out. Uh, hashtag uh, CNN blackmail. All you gotta do is put in CNN uh, CNN blackmail and and look that up. It, like I said, it is hilarious. It really is. I mean, it is it it is to the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my 
goodness gracious. These are these are getting funny, folks. Really, I got to get this over here real quick uh, on my main rig over here and just show you uh, what's going on. Uh, as soon as it opens up, it, it th this will make you laugh. <laughs> it's making it's making me laugh anyway. Uh, I don't know if it'll make you laugh, but it's making me laugh. So hang on just a second. Give me about two seconds here to get over there. Um, CNN blackmail. All right, here we go. Now, like I said, folks, this is this is this is pretty funny. <laughs> let me get uh, let me get a full screen view here uh, of this, and I'll let you guys see this. Uh, this first one here is. Uh, George Clooney chasing around a laser light. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that or not. Uh, hopefully you can uh, on the video and that. Uh, the next one's uh, from The Walking Dead. I said apologize or else I'll ruin you. Uh, the next one is from um, uh, The Avengers. Uh, and they put uh, Donald Trump's face on the Hulk. And they put CNN on Loki. And Loki gets beat up pretty good. <laughs> Oh my! This one's next one's the Matrix, and that's uh, I think this is a, a funny one. You know, Donald Trump just sitting there, just do 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 do, and Agent Smith has the CNN sign on him. <laughs> oh my goodness! So anyway, uh, that's 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 the extent <laughs> that's the extent of that. Um, now I'm gonna try to get out of the full screen here. There we go. Took a second for it to get out of full screen, I think. Oh, there it goes. So, <laughs> CNN really poked the bear with this one. They, they did, and I, like I said, I got to laugh uh, because you would think these guys who, who think they know, know everything when it comes to journalism, you think they would know better. You absolutely think they would, you would know better. And... Um, even even Slate, I was surprised when I came across this uh, article at Slate uh, by Will Orams. Uh, CNN clotheslined itself. CNN's crime wasn't blackmail; it was per, it was petty self righteousness, and and they nailed it. They nailed. It. They got it right over at Slate. I, I'm really really surprised about that. <laughs> they got it right over there, and it just again it amazes me. It amazes me how arrogant these people, how self-righteous they think they are. And it, again, we are in a cultural war. We talked, we, we talked about this from time to time. A few weeks back I did a show on, on the cultural war we're in. And CNN's on one side of it. And it seems like a lot of Americans are on the other side of the cultural war. A lot of uh, freedom-loving, liberty-loving individuals out there that, that know they may not know the Constitution as well as some other people, but they know what the government's doing is not right because they're infringing on their decisions each and every day. And there's a problem with that. There's a huge problem with that. And this is why people get ticked off. Um, this health care. I, I, I'm honestly, folks, I'm sorry if you think that Obamacare was the end all to be all to health care. And I put out this on Facebook. I put out a, um, a, a meme on there. It says millions of people didn't die before Obamacare, so why do you think millions of people are going to die after it goes? And I know it's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole, if you want to get accurate about it. But my high school friend, I think she took it all the wrong way. Because a lot of these people, anti-freedom crowd, don't care about the state. Don't give one wit about laws from the state. They just, they just don't. And the, the problem, the problem with not caring about the laws of the state is you don't know what they are. And you don't know, for, for example, that if Obamacare is repealed today, then anything governing health care goes back to the states. The states did not take the laws off their books. Legislatures are, are lazy that way. They don't take old laws off books. I don't know why. They just don't. They just keep adding laws to everything. 
And quite frankly, I think every fourth year, uh, and that would be maybe the year right after an election, uh, that year's legislature, unless it's an emergency something, uh, should be to go over and review laws and regulations in the bureaucracy and get rid of ones that don't matter anymore, that are outdated. But in, in the matter, in the province of health care, the states still have their laws on the books. So if the states still have their laws on the books and Obamacare is repealed, health insurance is still going to function. It'll function better because it was functioning better before Obamacare came along. A lot of people disagree with that. But if you take it down, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. I'm not saying that we only care about the individual because we must care about the society and the government that the individuals in that society set up. But if we're always making decisions from the top down, saying we're going to dictate this and say everybody has to do this, without regards to the individual and their wants, needs, and desires, their risk level, their, or their, uh, how much risk they're willing to take, if you never take that in consideration and you just have this herd mentality, which is what a democracy is, which if you'll listen to the language of the anti-freedom crowd out there, they do not call America a republic. They call us a democracy, big D democracy. And that, folks, I believe is on purpose because they want it to be. They want the decisions to come from the government down. They want, they want to get that 51% to tell the other 49% this is exactly what we're going to do. And you have no choice in the matter. And that's, that's one of the reasons why the, the Founding Fathers thought that democracies were evil. That's why they set up a republic, not a democracy. That's why you see so much turmoil in the world with these parliamentary systems. That is not a republic. That is democracy in action. It really is. And, and you see the turmoil that causes throughout the world. And yet... When we like when best example I can think of is in Iraq when when we were talking about I think arrogantly when we were talking about what kind of government should we set up in Iraq instead of talking to the Iraqi people and maybe maybe speak to them from the aspect of freedom and liberty and principles of freedom and liberty and share with them and educate them about the documents that led up to the founding of the United States of America and talk about individual friberties. <laughs> that's, that's the new word of the day, friberty. Uh, freedoms and liberties. I think you'd have had a, a, a stable gov government over in Iraq earlier than what, than what we did, and I still don't think it's a real stable government. But the, the, the professors, the, you know, the political scientists out there and stuff, oh, no, 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 no. No, you know, this, this Republican foreign government is, is, is wrong. We shouldn't impose this on other countries. And you're right, you shouldn't impose it on other countries, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't go and, and try to speak to these other countries and tell them, hey, you know, this is, this is the best thing going with individual freedoms and liberties. But the anti-freedom crowd does not like that. They don't like that at all. So we have a our fight for freedom in this country starts with the culture. There's an article here by Robin uh, Cormer, and I have his book and, and DVD that I'm going that I, I went through and I want to go through again. And uh, he makes a lot of good points in um, in this article here. It's, it's a little bit long. I'll just read the first couple of paragraphs here. He posted this on the. 4th of July this year, uh, the first approximation, to a first approximation of American political history before the 18th century is British political history. As most American school children know, in the 17th century, John Locke crystallized the idea that human law should reflect natural law, but the idea that law must serve the well-being of the people uh, on whom it is imposed goes back to at least to the Anglo-Saxons. He said, since tyranny must shape itself into both the law and the political institutions of its day, it stands to reason that when a governing elite has gone too far in abusing its power, the fight back for liberty by the people at large does not start directly in the political realm or in the legislation itself. That's what we're talking about, folks. The Convention of States, that's what they're talking about. He goes on to say, the culture precedes politics. 
People have preceded, preceded governments throughout history, throughout created history, folks. Throughout history, changing a country's pol politics and statutes has been the final goal of forcible popular attempts to contain power, but mass refusal to accept political abuses has always begun in the culture. Now, culture is a vague term, so let us define it as the sum of actions of the citizens of a country. The attitudes that drive their responses to events, their expectations of what they may do, and the memories of what they and perhaps their ancestors have always done. And this is why history, accurate, truthful, fact-filled history is so important to a culture, especially to a freedom, liberty culture. Because if we forget our histories, then we allow tyrants. And a tyrant could be in the White House, there could be tyrants in the legislature. There could be tyrants in the judiciary. There could be tyrants at our state houses. It doesn't have to be one person to be a tyrant. There could be multiple tyrants along the way from the top of the government back down to the individual. And this is something we have to get in our heads. But, but the culture, in order for us to win the day, Convention of the States, Freedom, Liberty, the Re Protecting the Republic, we have to get a hold of the culture, which means we have to get a hold of the individual and sit down and reason with him and her and talk about these things, talk about these histories. The American Revolution's Revolution was not so much an American Revolution as a British Revolution. The founding of the United States is just one example of this process. In 1776, American independence, as in 1689, the original Bill of Rights, 1628, the Petition of Rights, and 1215, the Magna Carta, and even 1014, Anglo-Saxon Charter, freedoms that citizens already believed they had were codified and, and uh, consensualized to shape the political institutions. And, and in each case, the shaping of political entities with the purpose of increasing or protecting the rights of free individuals that were already recognized in the culture has been invariably triggered by the outreach of the country's governing elite, or at least part of it. Seen in the light, seen in this light, the American Revolution was not so much an American Revolution as a British evolution, another turn in the ratchet of Anglo political theory, driven by the kind of cultural conservatism that all liberals should celebrate. As uh, William Pitt, the elder statesman and former British Prime Minister, said as he spoke against the Stamp Act in the year of the American founding, I rejoice that America has, America has resisted. Three million people so dead to the feelings of liberty as voluntary to submit to be slaves would have been fit instruments to make slaves of the rest of us. <laughs> he was afraid that we'd turn around and go, go conquer England. Um, this reflects the interesting fact that the attitudes that drove American independence were found not only among the colonists, they were as prevalent among the British uh, compatriots in the motherland, born from and into the same Anglo culture. Uh, Pitt's use of the word feelings is telling. Feelings are not defined in law or carved out, uh, carved, carved over the doors of most important state buildings. Rather, as Pitt was acknowledging, they are the sentiments that drive political change reflective of the prevalent attitudes and expectations of the society. And he goes, it's a good article, I want you to go read that. He talks about experience is key, and then he gets into the Snowden case and, and some other things in that. And, uh, but uh, the, the main point is our, our, freedom, our fight for freedom and liberty starts with the culture. It always has and always will. And we're always going to have some allies in the institutions that we're trying to change, but overwhelmingly, this is why the Revolutionary War happened, because the king... And the House of Parliament decided they didn't care what the colonists said. They're just colonists. They're supposed. To, they're there to do the bidding of the king. And they and the king forgot the humanity of the colonists. For one thing, we keep going back to this theme: people forgetting about folks' humanity. And so he set the dogs of war on the colonists. And again, he poked a bear. <laughs> He didn't realize, he did not realize 
what was going to happen. He thought, we're the biggest empire in the world, and who are these guys? They're just colonists over there? We'll wipe them out in two weeks. War went on considerably longer than two weeks, and we ended up chasing them off the peninsula down in Yorktown. And, and won on the battlefield our independence. We stated it on July 2nd. We, it was voted on July 4th. It was proclaimed. Uh, we'd been at war with Britain for almost a year at that point, and we'd go on for another five years after their fi- I have to get my dates right, but uh, quite a few years after that before York, before we finished up in Yorktown. And it was always about, the revolution was always about the individual. George Washington never wanted to force somebody to fight. You know, they, now they had conscripts, and, and you, you signed on for certain, not, I, and concept, conscripts may not be the right term. We're going to get into some history lessons, you know, about this, and we should get into more history lessons. But um, my, my point I want to make is there was a set term on their service, and they could, they could quit after that. Um, at the time, Negroes uh, could fight. And if they fought for a certain amount of months, you know, in place of their, their slave masters, uh, they earned their freedom. You know, that was good. To me, that was a good thing. I don't think they should have been slaves to begin with, but that's neither here nor he- there. That was history. That's it happened. Deal with it, okay? But if we're going to take back this country, if we're going to take back the uh, news culture from, from folks like uh, the fake news, you know, the... Uh, the comical news network over there. <laughs> We're going to take the news culture from them. It has to start with the individuals. It has to start with culture. We have to change people's minds about what they watch, what they consume as far as news. And this fight is something that's going to, it, it, it's never ending. You know, because we always have to be on guard for our freedom and our liberty. You know, we have to be aware, situ- situationally aware of our surroundings as far as culture and politics go. Because there's always going to be someone that gets in there that thinks they know best how to run your life, and they're going to get enough people through lies. This is, th- Folks, this is how socialism works. This is how tyranny works, because they lie to the people. Obamacare, nothing but lies. Trump care, nothing but lies. I- I'm sorry, I don't like Trump care either. I'm starting to call it Trump care because he's really been hammered on this. However, in the past couple of days, he said, look, folks, he said, let's just repeal Obamacare. Get that out of the way first, and then we'll work on it. And I'm, th- I'm saying repeal Obamacare, let the states take back over. And this may be a ploy of his. I don't know. Let them repeal Obamacare. You get that to my desk. I'll sign that. And then, then maybe we won't have a replacement bill. And then we'll let the free markets take over. You know, maybe pass a couple laws. About the mainly about the portability. You get rid of that portability law. Most states have pre-existing condition laws on the books already, but you get rid of that portability law, and Katie bar the door. You're going to see we're going to rise back up to a world-class healthcare system that everybody can afford. And if you can't afford it, there's going to be enough money uh, in the system that we can will take care of you without the government's help. You know. I can see so many possibilities just getting the government out of the way and let the free markets work. I really, really can. Um, there's another There's another article here from the Public Discourse, and I'm, this is a, a fairly long uh, article. It's called the, the Patriotism We Need, Principled and Spirited. This is by Carson Holloway, posted on July 5th of this year. Um, and I'm just going to read the first couple paragraphs here on this. I still got some time. Uh, the, president, the presidency of Donald Trump arises, uh, raises the question of patriotism more forcefully than it has been raised for a long time in American politics. On the one hand, Trump and his followers think of their movement as a restoration of a proper patriotism, an effort to rescue a country and a people from true interests of which have been shamefully neglected by an excessively cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan elite. On the other hand, Trump, Trump's critics think that he appeals to a dangerously uh, activistic nationalism and an unenlightened and extreme love of country that neglects our duties to the world community. Thus, the Trump movement and the controversy it has created force us to ask, what is a just and reasonable patriotism? 
more specifically, what kind of patriotism is appropriate to a country like America, which is founded on universal principles and not on any particular or exclusive ethnic or religious identity? Good article to read. It's about three pages long on a Word document, but it's got any type of patriotism we have to have. It has to be principled and spirited. And he, uh, Carson does a good job going down through this and explaining that. And, and I, I believe that, you know, because the patri to have blind patriotism and, and just say we're following this person, if you don't follow them, you're not patriotic. Uh, to me, that's an idiotic statement. The person that made it needs need to sit down and uh, go in a timeout corner and think about what he said or she said. <laughs> patriotism is not blind. Patriotism is principled. And being principled, it is thought out, reasoned, fact-filled, and truth-filled patriotism. And neither side, the left or the right, can claim that as, their, as wholly their own. Uh, patriotism is claimed by free and sovereign individuals. Now, uh, my buddy Dave uh, sent this over to me. Uh, NPR uh, does it, and they do this every year. They tweet out the Declaration of Independence on Twitter. And I thought, well, great, that's, that's good, you know, because I, I try to do the same thing. You know, I try to either have it read or I read it myself. One year I read it myself, or I try to find clips that are, that are where it's being read. Well, they got some backlash from the Trump supporters. Again, that's why I wanted to put this patriotism up first before I shared this article here. And hat, hat, hat tip to Dave for giving this to me. You know, this is an uh, NPR video, uh, so give this a, a real quick listen. Let me get my fair use up there. Uh, just give this a really quick listen, folks. It's only a, like a minute long, but it's, it's very, very telling of the wrong type of patriotism we have in this country. National Public Radio marked the 4th of July by tweeting the entire Declaration of Independence, but it seems some Twitter users didn't recognize what they were reading. The broadcaster tweeted out the words of the Declaration line by line Tuesday. Some of the founders' criticisms of King George III were met with angry responses from supporters of President Donald Trump, who seemed to believe the tweets were a reference to his presidency. Others were under the impression NPR was trying to provoke Trump with his tweets and praise the outlet for doing so. Many, recognizing was the Declaration of Independence, said how history is repeating itself. NPR broadcast its annual reading of the Declaration for the 29th straight year on Independence Day. This is the first year the tradition has been extended to Twitter. All right, now some Trump supporters, <laughs> when they were reading the allegations against King George, thought that NPR, again, even a clock is right, has the right time twice a day. NPR can get things right. And the reading of the Declaration of Independence is not a left-right thing. It's more of a freedom anti-freedom. I think we need to read the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution uh, more often. More often. And some of these other documents that I mentioned before. Uh, especially from John Locke, things like that. Uh, but some Trump supporters, President Trump supporters, took umbrage to this, thinking that they, NPR, was talking about Donald Trump. Now, you have to look through the Declaration of Independence and see why we were declaring independence from Britain. We just didn't willy-nilly do this. These were well thought out, reasoned, fact based allegations against England and especially the King of England on these usurpations of authority. Donald Trump is not, I'm sorry to tell some of these Trump supporters out here, Donald Trump is not perfect by no stretch of the imagination. And there's some things uh, from the get go that he is getting wrong. One's health care, uh, the other is economics. Well, He's a businessman. He knows economics. Uh, no, that, that's not necessarily the case. He knows how to rent seek from the government when it comes to uh, eminent domain issues for some of his properties. He knows how to get tax breaks from local uh, municipalities for building things there. He knows how to do that stuff. But as far as running an economy, he doesn't. And the problem with that, with, with either one person or just a group of people running the economy is they always get it wrong. They get it absolutely wrong. Look at the tariffs he's putting on Canadian lumber coming to the United States. 
Who's going to pay that higher cost? It's you and me. The consumer's going to pay that higher cost. It's, it's no more complicated than that, folks. It really isn't. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things, and I won't say everything, but there's a lot of things that Donald Trump gets wrong. There was a lot of things that President Obama got wrong that were not freedom and liberty oriented, that the government should not have been doing. Go back and read. Honestly, I think before someone becomes a presidential candidate, they need to read and understand the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and take a test on it. If you can't pass that test, you have no business running for office. I don't care if it's president or for Congress or even for the state capitals. If you don't understand people's freedoms and liberties and how to guard them, you shouldn't be in office, period. Not, not one bit. And that's why I keep going back and I'll end the show on the Convention of the States is that we the people elect those to govern over us. I know there's a lot of libertarians out there who don't agree with that. You know, well, tough. Go in your own corner. I'm not talking to you. You know, but I'm talking to people who know and understand God's word and know that no matter what you're going to do, libertarians, people are going to want to have some type of government. No matter what you do. And, and, and the only way you're going to disprove them of that is go set up a country that you can set up your stuff in and actually practice that and actually put that into practice and show the rest of the world, hey, look, we're a stateless government, and we can survive on our own. And, and, and then maybe the rest of the world will, will believe you, but there's too many people in this country that just don't buy that about no governance. So um, it's the end of the show, folks. Uh, the, the music's starting tomorrow. It's Free For All Friday. Hopefully we'll have some of the Internet connections uh, taken care of tomorrow. We we're supposed to get that router today. I think it's today, maybe it's tomorrow. Uh, but if not, uh, we'll we'll muscle through the show because I'll work the rest of the day trying to get everything set up for tomorrow. This has been Dan, this is the Dan Clemens Show. I'm your host, Dan Clemens, your Constitution War member. If you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. Have a great rest of the day, folks, and God bless, and we will see you tomorrow.